I, uh, I learned today that school is out this week. I think that was the teachers. Yeah. And, um, you know, always I'm desirous of being a good example for you, so I'm going to go on vacation this week. Come back and tell you, go and do likewise. <coughs> in, the, um, in the circumstances of life, we all start this journey as children, as far as I know, with the possible exception of Adam. And as a child, we tend to be followers. Now, I was a follower well into my 20s. In the circumstances of school, there's usually some kind of uh, perceived need to belong. We mistakenly refer to that as peer pressure, when in fact what's driving us is the desire for peer acceptance. And in my school, there were three different classes of people. There was the in crowd, there was the bullies, and there was the rest of us. So by one we would get scorned, and by the other we'd get picked on. Now it's very difficult to develop a sense of leadership or belonging when you're in an atmosphere like that. Anybody recognize that atmosphere? I don't want to know if you were in the in crowd. I'm still dealing with my issues. But those developmental days really begin to shape how we perceive ourselves. Now, when I, when I got into high school, maybe a year or so before that, that's when Daddy started to pull me out of school to be the free helper in his um, blue-collar construction stuff. And in those early days, I was basically a gopher. Go for this, go for that, bring me this, bring me that. And uh, it was a follow him around and do what he said sort of thing. And then somewhere in, those, in the evolution of that, I got my own tool belt. Had my own hammer, my own ruler. I started to look just like the rest of them in a much smaller version. But it was a big deal to start to look like the rest of them. But as you well know, looking like the rest of them does not make you one of them. And it's interesting to me, I, I had occasion to accompany my wife on one of her outings. You men will recognize this. To the mall. And uh, as we were wandering through this, she was there to pick up something and I was the chauffeur. I was looking at all these items. I mean, just an enormous amount of presentations, of pictures, and you know, there, there are two places I really hate to travel as an adult. One is the detergent aisle at the supermarket. I got a good sniffer, and that, that's just awful. And the other is the perfume counter at the department store, because Everybody comes up, squirts something different, and you walk into this noxious fog of smells, and you think, who would wear that? But I was, I was struck by all the things that a woman needs to purchase to feel like a woman who's acceptable to other women. I picked up, I picked up a pair of, actually just one of them, of a sandal. I mean, it had a heel about like that, and it was pretty much flat, had a little gold thingy here, and they wanted 90 bucks for something that's obviously not at all comfortable. And I thought, why do y'all do that? And then I remembered, you do it for us, so we'll notice. <laughs> In this issue of following, we end up chasing various and sundry personalities because we think we want to be like them. Um, if you know any truth at all about life, it's because God has put that truth into play. So that when you come to the Lord and your eyes are finally opened, I, I remember being relatively Sunday school familiar with the scriptures, 
But when I became an adult and really began to pursue the Lord with, with intentionality, I was surprised at how many things I'd learned in life that I later found in the scripture. Anybody recognize that? Oh, I didn't know that was in there. <laughs> well, in the uh, developmental process, you go through moments of recognition that Jesus has been at work in your life long before you knew Jesus was at work at all. And when you look back, you start to see things that he's done for you. For instance, there, there are two experiences in my life that have really been the redefining moments of who I have become and, and am becoming. One was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was in undergraduate work at that time in my early 20s. I had gone into the Navy right out of high school, so I had like four years of service, and then my next four was assigned to school at the University of Louis Louisville. Louisville. You shove that cotton in the side of there, and you're going to say Louisville, if you're going to live there in Louisville. It's like Calvert County? No, Colbert County. But that's an A, you know, but it's pronounced U, Colbert. Anyhow, in the, uh, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it, it was the threshold into the power of the kingdom. Now, this happened to me back in this thing which is now historically called the charismatic movement back in the mid-70s, 1974. Patty and I came into this phenomenon. And it was a redefining thing because it opened up my Southern Baptist eyes to the fact there was an awful lot we had not embraced that was life transforming. And the other, the other interesting thing, not only was I introduced to the power of the kingdom, I was introduced to the authority of the kingdom when I raised my hand and solemnly swore and became an able officer. Because it's in a position of authority that is under authority and has authority, you begin to understand authority. You follow me? The principles of that kingdom translate quite nicely into the principles of the kingdom because they're the same truths. And when you begin to deal with and experience the power of the kingdom and the authority of the kingdom, you're finally on your way to something we call maturity. So I spent the first 25 years or so of my life as a follower. And then the Lord began to redefine who that human being was going to become. Because when, you, when you've spent your life as a follower, it's not, that, it's not that difficult to start following the Holy Spirit. Because you're used to following someone. And as you begin to grow in Christ, you have to decide who you are going to follow. Now, let's suppose you say you're going to follow Jesus. Doesn't that sound religious? I have decided to follow Jesus. Y'all remember that? Sang it when you were little? Didn't know what it meant, but you liked it? Because Sunday school teacher smiled when you sang it. And mama would go, oh, that's so good. Sing it for me again. Off tune. Mommies love that. In the, uh, in the circumstances of being empowered by the Holy Spirit, you may find this hard to believe, but I was clumsy and inarticulate. No, not you. And um, I was also bold and willing to take risk. And I found out something about religious people. They want you to conform, not transform because they can control you if you're a conformer. They can't control you if you're transformed. Religion needs you to be in your place on time, sit quietly and listen. Jesus wants to make a place for you, stand you up in it so others will listen. So I, I began very early to have this consternation about trying to respond to religious leaders who clearly saw things differently than I had come to see them. And it put me in many situations that were familiar to a lot of us. The loss of friends, confrontation with authority, any of that sound familiar? 
Because Jesus will get you in trouble if you'll follow him. He will. He will just get you in trouble and show up for you while you're in it. Because he's jealous to put himself on display. I want to begin a journey with you today of looking at some things that are pertinent to our concept of becoming mature. And I want to do it by getting back into the Gospels and taking a look at some of the stuff that Jesus will require of those of us who decide to become followers. Did you know followership is actually a word now? So is selfie. It was added last year to the dictionary. Isn't that great? Selfie. What that is, honey, is you hold the camera out here and take a picture of self. Selfie. But I want to talk about followership, not selfies. Followership is used to communicate the ability or the willingness to follow a leader. The ability or the willingness. It can be as an individual or a group of persons on a mission under the oversight and direction of somebody else. How many of you know that it sounds good to follow Jesus? Two of us, great, super, all right. It's back to Sunday school for the rest of you. And it always sounds good until you actually start doing it, right? Because you suddenly find yourself surrounded by those who give mental assent but do not apply shoe leather to the concept of following Jesus. And when you get in that crowd, you start to stand out from the crowd in a very particular way. Y'all heard the, um, the story about the guy who races up to a crowd of folks and said, which way did the parade go? I'm their leader. Okay. The primitive definition I heard of leadership many years ago was this. Is anybody following you? The question is, are you following anybody? When Jesus comes out of the wilderness, well, backdrop. John the Baptist comes out of the wilderness preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tempted and when he comes out, he finds out that, G that John's been put in prison. So what does Jesus do? He, from that time forward, he began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, there are several things about this that you're going to have to come to grips with. I'm, I'm going to wander through Matthew chapter 4 and 5 this morning and just highlight a few things for your consideration when you go back in there and read it for yourself. And you're going to do that, aren't you? Both of you. Great. That's wonderful. We're going to move right along through the summer, I can tell. We're just going to fly over. Do a fly over, Okay. Now, if you're going to follow Jesus, one of the things you've got to come to grips with is that you must become the steward, the caretaker, the guardian, the perpetuator of an unpopular message. John went to jail on the basis of the message, and Jesus immediately picked up the message and began to communicate the message to whoever would listen. And when you begin to communicate that message, you draw two attention from two different groups. Those who resonate with it and those who oppose it. Any of y'all know anything about Southern Baptists? Okay. Imagine that you're me, a Southern Baptist, and you have been recently baptized in the Holy Spirit and you now speak in tongues. Immediately, there are those who will oppose you. But there are others who hunger and thirst after righteousness in reality, not merely in precept. And they start to find you as well. And then you, three, four, five, six of you, begin to experience the fellowship of suffering until you relocate. Does that make any sense? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, some of y'all lived through that, I get it. Now, this issue of the kingdom is important, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because this is an overview, but most of us came into the body of Christ through the gospel of salvation. That is, come to Jesus, go to heaven. When you die, I'm not going to bore you with repeating what I've said for the last nine years. But the gospel of the kingdom is different from that gospel. It, it restores. It's the gospel of reconciliation, restoring you to a previous standing. So when Jesus comes into the earth as the Father's representative, he comes to adjust the understanding of people who have lost their way in both sin and religion. Because when he came into play, religion had pretty much bound up the good news and made it inaccessible. So Jesus is now the living representation of that, and he is stewarding the Father's message. Now in that message, he begins to uh, go around and he has some folks follow him. So in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus comes out of the wilderness, one of the first things you see him do is he starts to collect followers. He comes along the seashore, he sees uh, uh, Peter and Andrew mending their nets. And he says to them, come follow me. And so they quit what they were doing, they started following him. They left their livelihood to chase after a blue collar rabbi. And nearby were the sons of Zebedee, James and John. He beckoned to them, and they came following as well. Now, what happens when you decide to follow Jesus? What's one of the first things that he does? Well, he lets you just trail him around. When you go into Matthew chapter 4, and you begin to look at verse 17 uh, to 23, there's a bridge in there between the calling and the next uh, motion that I'll take you to in a moment. Jesus says... Uh, uh, Matthew says in 4.17 that Jesus began to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In verse 23, Jesus goes about teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now, as he's doing that, he's got these four guys following him around. And what are, their see what are they seeing? They're seeing the methodology of Jesus and announcing the gospel of the kingdom, which is words and works. This is what they're watching. They're not doing anything. They're just following in trail. And as they do, they begin to see things. Now, in verse 24, 23 and 24, Jesus was going throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of sickness among the people. Jesus was going throughout all of Galilee, teaching, proclaiming, and healing. But things change in verse 24. When it says, the word got out, and his Twitter and Facebook people started showing up where he was. I'm just backfilling so you get the story. And they brought to him. He was going, teaching, proclaiming, and healing. And now the crowds are coming to him. Because the word got out, there was somebody speaking with authority and moving in power. Now, the boys are still just following. And they're watching all of this stuff. They brought, they brought to him all who were ill, those who were suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Back in the early 80s, I got introduced to a very peculiar person named Mahesh Chabda. I met him through um, a pastor friend in Annapolis, Maryland, and I was invited up to sit in a pastor's gathering with this man who had just that year had hands laid on him in the local church and had been sent out as a healing evangelist to the nations. And so he's pretty much unknown. Now in that situation, being the young, cocky, clumsy, inarticulate, passionate risk taker that I was at that time, I watched this phenomenon of this grace I had never been exposed to personally. See some things on TV, but don't believe everything you see on TV. And as I sat through that first meeting 
in that first year, there were two things that struck me. First, I didn't believe he was sincere because I had never met anyone who loved people with the magnitude of affection that he had for people. Secondly, I had never seen demonstrations of spirit and power as an eyewitness, apart from one Captain Coleman meeting years before. So when the second year rolled around, we hauled a few carloads of people up to Annapolis. And uh, at a certain point, I'm sitting out there in the crowd, and it's a large building. So you've got like 80 people standing across the front waiting to be uh, prayed for. And I'm watching this little gentle Indian fellow kind of walk along and do stuff like this. And they just, <laughs> it's just the way my mind works. That's got to be some serious bad breath. <laughs> but it wasn't that at all. I was learning some things. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting probably halfway back in this large crowd of people watching stuff going on. And I couldn't quite follow it. And so I, um, I said, well, you're a pastor. You have, you have the right to move around this place. So I just walked on up front and I got, um, I got my back to the platform. Now I'm watching from behind him as he's moving. And he prays for somebody over here and the spirit falls upon them and they fall out. And then he walks way over to this side and prays for somebody over here. And I thought, doesn't this guy know how to run a healing line? <laughs> this was many years ago. But I'm telling you, there's a journey involved in this business. And... Um, I watch this happen, and I'm, I'm saying things like that in my mind, assuming I know more than the guy who's got the grace. You get it? You know, I just love it. I probably shouldn't tell you this. I'll tell you this anyway. <laughs> you know, it's amusing to me when you come to me and shake my hand and say, Pastor, that was a really good message. I agreed with everything you said. That's not what makes it good. I'm not even impressed with that statement. I want to know that your thinking has been challenged, not just affirmed, that you got provoked to consider something you didn't know before. That's what satisfies me, because then I feel like I'm helping you. But anyhow, back to the story. So I'm standing up there, and I've got this dialogue going on in my mind with the Lord. And then he starts moving from there, I spot the Holy Spirit come upon someone. Now, what does that mean? They're standing there like this, waiting, and all of a sudden they're standing there like this. <laughs> it was like somebody flipped a switch. And then I watched him see them, and he went in that direction. And just before he got to me, some presence sat me down on the platform. And the light went on. He was following the Holy Spirit. And it changed the way I saw things forever. Before I quit praying for people and had you pray for them, I used to just watch and see where's the Lord's activity and start there. And if you move someplace else, go over there. But later on, there comes a time where you can say, come Holy Spirit. And he just manifests to all of them. He'll leave a few standing for you to minister to, but he'll take care of the rest. Now, in the course of those years of traveling, there were a number of years. We'd spend two to three weeks a year on the road up here in the North Virginia and North, let's say, Pennsylvania. And I don't think we went any farther west than Ohio in those days. But each and every time, my job was very simple. Drive the car, manage the book table, uh, manage the healing line, fetch water, get coffee, wash socks, whatever it was. Carry the briefcase, do the driving, sit up late counting the offerings, whatever was necessary to move from one location to another. And for me, it was absolute honor and glory. 
because I got to stand right there and watch what the Holy Spirit was doing. And the Lord would speak to me. He would show me things. Later, as we moved together more as a team, I was, um, I mean, a ministry team, not just a gopher. I was prophesying way above my pay grade in those situations. Right? So the Lord was using these years to give me instruction on how to respond to him. And then later, when we had that visitation in 1994, it upended everything I ever thought I knew about the Bible or God or the Holy Spirit. And by then, I had had some years of experience. So when you decide that you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to be willing to have him do things that will offend your mind in order to expand your understanding. Now, I'm presently engaged with a wonderful wonderful group of pastors in our local area. And I, I, I say wonderful for this reason. They have the same spirit toward one another. The theological diversity I represent in that group is huge, but they receive me on the basis of a witness in the spirit. That's a big deal to the Lord. We have always tried to be inclusive in this congregation because we are not the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And to receive them even when they reject us is an important part of demonstrating the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ because he speaks to us about those things. When you decide to follow the Lord, you've got to be willing to be trained. Therefore, you have to be willing to be taught. I have come across some unteachable people in my adult life. You would probably use the vernacular, know-it-alls. And it doesn't matter what the subject is, they know it all. But when they get into the, the subject of the Bible or religion or denominations or doctrine, all they know is what they know. And they will not be moved from it. Do you understand me? And the problem with not being a lifetime learner and I don't mean just in formal education. I mean in life. The problem with choosing not to be a lifetime learner is that you calcify in whatever it is you presently know. And you become dogmatic when the Lord has moved generations beyond that. Okay? If you're willing to be taught, the Lord will challenge everything you think you know. Because there are some things you know that are true, but you don't know them the way he wants you to know them. Your application, administration of that one truth is totally insufficient for what the truth represents. But if you won't let him teach you, you're stuck with the little bit that you have. You following this? All right. So, in, the, um, in this thing called the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins to teach people about the alternative way of thinking if you're going to follow him. Now, in it, there are a number of things that he does. For instance, how many of you know children want what they want when they want it? Mm -hmm. And if they never mature, then you're married to a husband or wife who wants what they want when they want it, and they'll manipulate and goad and harass and threaten until they get it. But Jesus understands that you have to start with people as if they're children. So how does the Sermon on the Mount start? Blessed are you, and blessed are you, and blessed are you, and blessed are you, and blessed are you. Right? Because he's coming to those who are children in their understanding. They're not ignorant of religion, but they're ignorant of the kingdom. And so he begins to comfort them by saying, there is blessing for you in the kingdom. And I believe it's in... in uh, Verse 11, where he says that very specifically. Is it? Oh, man. Don't you hate it when you hit the down button, you meant to hit the up button? He says, oh, good, let's look at it there. Uh-huh, mm-hmm, uh-huh. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. However, comma, what's the rest of it say? 
No, I don't want that part. I just want the first part. That's how we are. But Jesus is saying that there's something other than widespread acceptance that is important to him. Because if you're going to be the one who follows in his group, you can anticipate the other group is going to be upset with you about it. And who is the other group? It's the group you've been living with all this time. Now, after he gets through that, he begins to talk about the contrast between who you are to become and what you were. Because if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, he's, he's anticipating that a change should be visible in you. And so in, um, in verse 12, he says, expect persecution. You get on down to verse 20, and he says, yeah, there is such a thing as righteousness, but I got news for you. It ain't what you've been talking about. The righteousness that you have seen is as filthy rags to me. And if you're going to be righteous, you had better be more righteous than those who say they're righteous. Have you ever been around those who say they're righteous when they're really wrongness? You know, they're just irritating because they will condemn everything that you do by the standard that they have exalted to which they themselves cannot measure up. They just pretend. Jesus starts addressing these issues and calling for a demonstration of alternative behavior in you. But it's not just behavior. It's the manifestation of a change inside of you that only the Spirit can accommodate. Keep in mind now, there are no born-again people in this crowd. Y'all need to keep that in mind. Jesus never healed a born-again person. He never prayed for any charismatics in his ministry, or Baptists, or Catholics. He prayed for people who needed to be reconciled to the Father. So if you think Jesus doesn't answer the prayers of those who are not saved, you don't know Jesus because he does these things to demonstrate that he is real. But if you're going to be taught, you're going to have to be first teachable. Jesus says, <clears throat> I require you to go beyond your present level of understanding. For instance, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. You all ever heard that? Do you know it's one of the ten? Just because it's near the bottom, don't make it less important. Okay. Jesus said, don't do that. And then he went on to say, but I say to you. In stone it says, don't commit adultery. They bring to him the woman caught in adultery in the very act. But he goes on to say, but if you look, upon another of the opposite sex and have lustful thoughts in your heart toward them, you're already guilty. How many of you know that's tough? That's tough. Now, what is he doing? He is awakening the reality that the law is totally insufficient to support the kingdom. Okay? Because you cannot obey the law because the kingdom requires an internal adjustment that only then can satisfy the requirements of the law apart from the law because you become the law written upon your heart. It transforms who you are. And this is what he's after. He's laying out an impossible scenario. This constitution of his kingdom is absolutely impossible to fulfill apart from the person of God, the Holy Spirit's indwelling. It can't come any other way. And if you think for a moment that you can continue to live under obedience to commands and that gives you standing with God, then you're religious and probably seriously impaired in your understanding of salvation. By the works of the law shall no man be justified. And if you break the law in one point, you're guilty of all of it. So when you've got your Christian friends thinking they need to buy themselves a Jewish prayer shawl and celebrate uh, Hanukkah and, you know, re return to this uh, pseudo-messianic whatever, 
be careful about moving toward that issue of self-discipline for right standing. Because if you return to the law, you lie against the grace that's already been released from the law in the person of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to back away slowly and drop the chocolate. Nobody will get hurt. Jesus goes on <clears throat> to talk about this issue of motivation. Down in verse 43, he begins to put the taproot of his kingdom into play. Okay, we'll go this far and then call it a day. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Any Hatfields or McCoys here? Any people from the South know how to pronounce the name damn Yankee? Okay. Anybody from Maine who looks like, looks upon the crazies in California? See, our life is full of hating others. It is our default position. Other times, people give us provocation to hate them. They rape and kill your daughter. That burst the Stephanie Roper Committee, which changes the punitive laws in the state of Maryland. We supported that back when that young uh, uh, Frostburg girl was brutally raped and murdered. Or a nation invades your nation and other nations and causes great destruction. And for three generations, just to mention the other nation, will raise the emotional climate around the dinner table. So Jesus understands the issue of hate the Samaritans because we're the pure line. And he says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. What does he say? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Any of you ever persecuted in, in your elementary or high school days? Three of us. Boy, the rest of you just didn't have any hope of maturing. Was praying for them your first response? Of course not. Why do you think there's the skinny guy on the outside, you know, doing the weightlifting, and then, y'all may not remember those days, but the big guy comes along the beach and kicks sand on the little skinny guy. And so the little skinny guy goes and buys himself some weights. Why? So he can pray for those who are persecuting him? <laughs> Aha, you get it. Okay. If you're going to follow Jesus, then you have to accept the responsibility for being the one who has to be changed through transformation. It is not the other person who's going to change. You are because he's in the business of changing. As you start, he will just let you listen for a while. Hopefully, he'll put you in a situation where you can see demonstrations of spirit and power and hear words of authority like, the name of Jesus destroys the authority that establishes disorder. Now, when you begin to exercise that authority, kingdom power starts to show up. And in it, you, you actually get to play for a while. Do you understand? The Lord gives great grace to you as you're learning these things. And he'll let you press the envelope. You know, I've had some great moments I would not want to repeat because I know better now. But God showed up anyway in spite of my foolishness because I was trying to find out how much he'd let me get away with in the Holy Spirit. If you're willing to let that come into your life, you can anticipate you will become one of the polarizing agents in the sphere in which you travel. Even your own family members will go, okay, they're here. Please don't talk about religion. 
Sometimes out of politeness, they'll ask you to say the blessing at Thanksgiving. But they tell you if you start praying for the missionaries, they're going to kick you underneath the table. As you begin to allow him to teach you how to steward this message, he will supply to you opportunities to have followers. Because when you start putting on the kingdom show, those who are hungering and thirsting after that are going to migrate towards you. And they're going to be looking for answers you don't have to questions you haven't yet thought about. And that will be part of the way he trains you to go deeper into him. It'll also be one of those moments where the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom starts to show up for you and you begin to experience another aspect of who the Holy Spirit is. And when that pressure comes on you, you start to be willing to be taught because you have a sense of love responsibility to those who are looking to you. And so you dig deeper into the things of God. Does that make sense to you? Have you experienced some of that already? Okay. Now, where I'm trying to take us is this. It is my personal conviction that until you own your responsibility to others, your maturation process is impeded. When you start to stand up as a follower of Jesus and he starts to assign followers to your voice, there's a responsibility in that that changes you. And I'm going to come back and visit this. But are you teachable? Are you a follower? See how quickly it thins? <laughs> you know, if you think following Jesus is sitting on a chair on Sunday mornings, you have no idea why we gather. We gather to scatter. You're the seed that he sends all across our community and Oklahoma. <laughs> I, I also want to acknowledge that West Virginia is in the room. <clears throat> I'm not going to call you to account today for anything in particular, but trust me, I'm going to trouble your waters. I'm going to try to make you as uncomfortable as I can with the reality of the truth so that you and Jesus have to have a fresh conversation about who you're going to be when you grow up. Would you stand? To our first time guests, I'd like to invite you out to the hospitality room at the close of this prayer. The rest of you just hang around and snack and yak and hug on somebody. Jesus, we are, by your blood and by your sacrifice, yours. But our ownership has been marred by the lack of understanding others have given to us. I'm asking God the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our understanding and allow us to see afresh what it means to belong to Jesus. Each of us, Lord, is on a journey. Some of us are just beginning. Some of us are seeing the end of this road. But all along the way, it is your intention that we begin to look more and more like the Father's representative. So I ask you to awaken us. I ask you to pinpoint those things that are in us that oppose you and call it to our attention. And I pray, Father that your demonstrations of spirit and power will continue to manifest through these lives and those they represent, and that your word of wisdom will confound their employers and those who look to them, and that we, Lord, will hear together the glory of your intervention in our lives because you're on the move and asking us to move with you. Seal these words in our heart. Blow away the chaff. Let us feed, Lord, upon the reality of your word and your presence in our lives to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.